These words are spoken in the name and the love and the power of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a love story about this church and about how the living flame of love burns in this church, animating everyone and everything. Now, I know this may sound phantasmagorical or theoretical or something else, but I can tell you it's not. We're talking about a story with real love, real people living in a real world. And during this past year, that real world disrupted every one of those real lives. We all remember it. We know it well. This parish church was there. The ministry morphed to meet people's spiritual, their physical, and their emotional needs. What's, what follows now is the story of what happened in the 256th year of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in New Canaan, Connecticut. Last year's annual State of the Church address was entitled 10 plus one things you should know about your church. It told the story of a parish fully alive. The first slide was the church school uh, is larger than the median size of an Episcopal church in the United States by nearly 40 people. The last slide was the former presiding bishop Frank Griswold's comment. He said that St. Mark's was the most impressive parish that he had ever visited as a bishop. Frank said to me over and over that his visit to St. Mark's had incredibly energized him about the future of the church. In between those two slides, there was a slide about the seven challenges we faced as a community in the coming year. The list of seven challenges did not include a global pandemic that would kill our beloved Bill Pike and to date kill over 400,000 Americans and over 2 million people worldwide. And even now, a year later, still keep us in the red zone of worry. It did not include that this novel virus, which is smaller than the head of a pin, would cause the complete disruption of normal life as we know it. It did not include that the governor would order us all to stay home and stay safe. It did not include the disruption of economic life locally, nationally, and worldwide. When I gave that talk, almost none of us knew who Dr. Fauci was. That list of seven challenges did not include the unequivocal unmasking of the pandemic of racism. No one knew that the murder of George Floyd by a policeman would unleash the Black Lives Matter movement, incite rioting, and ignite a holy desire by people of all colors, and notably white people, to dismantle racism. That list of seven challenges did not include a mental health pandemic of loneliness, anxiety, and depression. One third of Americans suffer from clinical anxiety or depression or both. This is not just theoretical. That means one third of the people of our parish suffer from this. The list of seven challenges did not include the escalation of political discord and division leading up to the election in what has been termed an uncivil war that divides our country, our communities, our churches, and our families. That list of seven did not include the January 6th storming of the Capitol, where an insurrection sought to disrupt the peaceful transfer of power, leaving the whole country even more anxious than it already was. As John Lennon said, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. When the pandemic came to town, it was personal. On the second Sunday of Lent, Bill Pike went to the hospital. Reverend Elizabeth visited the next day on Monday. On Tuesday night at 10 o'clock, Kathy Pike called to say that Bill had COVID-19. Elizabeth had to quarantine the first of her two quarantines. On Wednesday the 11th, we closed the doors of the church for the first time since 9-11 and stopped all in-person gathering. Initially we said it would be for two weeks and then we would see how things unfolded. On Thursday morning while I was shaving, I asked myself, what do the people of the parish need in this time of trial? I got an immediate answer. Mike Handler, the emergency management director of the town of New Canaan. By Thursday morning, 
The church staff Zoom room became like the Churchill War Rooms. The staff became like warriors of love, seeking to make sure everyone was safe and well cared for. The staff and the vestry engineered a monumental pandemic pivot. It was like rebuilding a bike while riding it. Though the doors closed, the ministry never did. In fact, it kicked into a higher gear as we executed normal business and created new systems on how to proceed. Every conversation became a pastoral conversation for everybody on the staff and for everybody on the vestry. People poured out their woes. Free-floating anxiety needed a place to touch down. And then on the third Sunday of Lent at 9 o'clock, Sunday mornings with Mike was born. It was done on the fly with Jill fielding questions that came in over the email and her text. And Mike taught us in real time what the coronavirus was and how we could best react to it. The town poured in to listen to Mike. And then at 10 o'clock, the church was empty, and the celebrant and the preacher looked directly into the camera and said, So for the first time in my 25 years as a priest, I am so happy to say that I'm glad you're not here. The number of people watching that stream far outnumbered the number of people normally in church. And we were poised for this moment because we had been streaming for years. This was an outgrowth of a year-long program that we had in 2013 and 2014 where we studied the future. During that time, we did hear something about a pandemic possibility and also about the importance of digital ministry. Then on Wednesday the next week, both Bill Pike and Joe Emlinger, two men beloved of our congregation, took a decided turn for the worse. Everything was locked down. There was no visitation. Then in one unforgettable morning, we managed last rites over the phone with Bill. That included Kathy and her adult children, many of whom were in different locations. And over this phone, we said those prayers. The Pikes were able to say goodbye to Bill. It was both heartbreaking and holy at the same time. When we hung up, Bill died six minutes later. And then literally within a minute of my hanging up, I received a call from Joe Emlinger's son. It was a FaceTime call. Joe wanted to do last rites. And so there with the, Joe's two sons kneeling at his side, we did last rites over FaceTime. All this was able to happen because Reverend Elizabeth and Father Justin had gotten me to think this through. So together we made plans and when the time come, we were ready to go. It was all so novel that uh, surprisingly, this made CNN and newspapers as far away as England and Asia. Bill was the second person in the state of Connecticut to die from the novel coronavirus. And Joe died a few days later from cancer. Together we discovered the power of our sacred rites as we knew the pain of not being able to gather to celebrate the lives of those we loved. As the world shut down, our digital ministry opened up. Yes, we went to Zoom like everyone else in the world, but our director of communications, Megan Farrell, pivoted and leaned into social media. And suddenly our services, sermons, video logs, preludes, postludes, storytellers, teachings, youth interviews had broad coverage and broad appeal on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. One of the video logs said it all, 10 holy habits to stay calm and carry on. People were spiritually hungry and we were feeding them. It was like the parable of the sower. We were throwing that seed far and wide. Meanwhile, we had the passing of the peace program where we reached out to all of the members of the church. We participated in town Zoom calls, helping to care for the whole town. And Holy Week and Easter were coming fast. We recreated how it was that we would do these sacred liturgies. And Ned Tipton, our maestro, became Le Mixure. And on Fast Forward, he trained himself to record, mix music, and create Zoom choirs. He was amazing. Then Easter came, and we celebrated, as the sermon said, Happy Weird Easter. At the end, we watched a slideshow, a virtual gathering of people near and far, and our hearts were broken 
when we saw pictures of Bill and Joe in one another. We truly were a church without walls. This is something we had hoped for for years, but now people from throughout the country and even throughout the world gathered to participate in our community of love. And many members who consider themselves former members joined back up again. They joined in on Zoom and they joined in on the stream. How great it is that geography is no longer an impediment to our communion with one another. We became a leader in the church as churches from throughout the country called us to find out how it was that we did what we did. Not only do we reach far, but we reached in. We became more deeply embedded in our town. We joined with our brothers and sisters in Christ, participating in weekly Zoom calls with the leaders of the Episcopal Church in Connecticut. We had a second round of passing the peace, this time in particular calling families who were struggling with staying home as schooling and careers careened into each other. And Father Justin and Reverend Elizabeth spent so much time speaking with people about how it is that they would handle their funerals and their weddings. May came, the first May without a Mayfair in over 60 years. This was difficult for everybody. The vestry pivoted, as did the Outreach Commission and all of the outreach ministries, as we made sure that the money that we gave away was targeted to those suffering from the pandemic. People went to work in new ways. The discretionary fund that the clergy have got more work as housing insecurity and food became a bigger deal. And the youth, God bless the youth of our parish, they became pen pals with homebound elders. These intergenerational bonds of love were beautiful for both the giver and the receiver. Then, on May 25th, George Floyd was brutally murdered. And we pivoted immediately to address racism in America. On June 7th, parishioner Tom Jones came to that 9 a.m. stream and later was joined by Lee's Least. And singularly and together, they were stirring and people joined the stream from near and far. People's hearts were moved by their deep insights and witness. Food insecurity was an issue in our community. We addressed it in video logs and at the food pantry and the gospel garden. We had intense deliberations on how to return to the fundamentals of our faith community. And then on July 5th, we came together for Holy Eucharist outside. It was a Holy Communion as people received the sacrament they longed for. They had a Holy Communion in seeing one another. There was a pastoral backlog in services and Reverend Elizabeth became Elizabeth the Baptizer and Father Justin became Justin the Barrier. I know it doesn't have the same cachet, but I just want to say Justin helped a lot of people uh, bury their loved ones, as did Elizabeth. And so on came a storm in August. Oy vey, right? A tropical storm. It was just that type of year. As summer became fall, St. Mark's Preschool opened up with outdoor classrooms. So much work went into this, it came off flawlessly. People were rattled, and the teachings on meditation and the Sermon from the Rocks in Maine were so deeply appreciated. We also sought to stay in communion with our children, and in an act of creative brilliance, created a homegrown magazine of the highest quality for kids and for their families. The beautiful thing about this was that it was not in video format. We delivered an old school magazine that was cutting edge and so appreciated. And then when St. Francis Day, we had the blessing of the animals, 163 people, 163 pets. It was a holy love fest, barking included. And our own Francis, the pastoral pup, has been working. And what a beautiful ministry she has. She is a great bomb to so many during this time of social distancing. When human beings are trying to stay far away from one another, Francis moves in. We all, of course, remember the fall and the political discord, and we had the right teaching at the right time. It was yet another pivot, as our own Dr. J, Jewel Bickle, offered a four-week Zoom teaching and conversation on how to disagree virtuously. Meanwhile, we had a third passing of the peace, and the vestry reached out to see how people felt about coming inside for worship. We would have done it, but there was a second surge in the pandemic, and we stayed outside. We wondered how long we would stay. We were there last Sunday. It was in the 20s. And with the pandemic not ending, we mobilized to deliver Advent to people's homes. Jan Maines, our director of children's ministry, oversaw the delivery of Advent story maker boxes to every child in the church school. 
and we sent out books to every child under the age of two. Moreover, the Advent Greens to go had more than twice the number of takers than would usually come to Advent Wreath Making Sunday. The staff began to plan Christmas in October. We knew that everyone needed a warm-hearted Christmas. We worked hard to plan an outdoor service, and that outdoor service came off flawlessly. We worked hard to plan the world's greatest virtual Christmas pageant, and it really is the world's greatest virtual Christmas pageant. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It will delight your soul. And Ned stayed up night and day and night and day and night and day to give us the gift of an extended Christmas prelude. It was just beautiful. And then, of course, for the 6 o'clock stream, Graham Ernst stole the show with his most beautiful rendition of Linus reciting the gospel as part of the Peanuts Christmas reenactment. Meanwhile, while all this was going on, Father Justin, our theologian in residence, was awarded his doctorate in theology from Yale. Congratulations, Justin. As New Year's came, we all hoped for a new day. But those hopes were dashed on January 6 with the storming of the Capitol. We met that moral moment with the pastoral letter and three sermons, one by each of the clergy, on a Christian approach to the state of our nation. Each sermon built upon the other, deepening the teaching. Martin Luther King said, The true measure of a man is not how he behaves in moments of comfort and convenience, but how he stands at times of controversy and challenges. We as a community have met this moment of controversy and challenge with a full measure of love that affects more people than you know. To give you some sense of this, I want to share another measure of our community with some metrics that will give you a sense of the size and the scale of this ministry of love. St. Mark's has 522 households, plus another 83 newcomer households. That means we have 1,524 members. This includes 22 new members. In addition, we have 185 newcomers who are exploring membership in our parish. And moreover, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of others who are connected with us, but we do not know how to count or categorize them in this new hybrid church. We have a terrific newcomer committee. And to give you some sense of that, led by Lynn Donahue and Jill Ernst, our newcomer committee wrote 363 Welcome to Town Notes in 2020. Wonderful. God bless you and thank you. In a community of love, pastoral care is of the utmost importance. The people of our congregation span 100 years. We love and care for and encourage human flourishing throughout the whole of the life cycle. On Friday, we presented Edith Linger with a vestry commendation on her 100th birthday. It was cold outside, but boy, was it a warm-hearted event. She has been a devoted member of St. Mark's since 1923. During the past year, the three clergy probably helped about 600 people through a particular pastoral event. In total, the three Passing the Peace programs reached about 1,200 households. The Samaritan Ministry reached out to about 250 seniors who are in facilities and are homebound. The Community of Hope, our pastoral care ministry, had over 350 contacts during the past year. We as a church are grateful to the Community of Hope, which is so ably led by Charlene Berardino. They care in a loving way for so many in our parish. And the number of caring calls that Beth Ralston has made are simply uncountable. I want to give you a sense of our digital ministry. Since the pandemic's head in, we have had 30,000 users on our website. That translates into 100,000 page views. That's twice as many as the year before. Last Easter Sunday, we had nearly 1,200 devices tune in to our stream. We know that on many of those devices, there is more than one person on the other side. For instance, we are grateful to be the Sunday service at the local New Canaan Inn. God bless all of you. There are many countries that use our website for spiritual content, notably we seem to be popular in Italy. Take a look at the cities 
Norwalk, New Canaan, Rome, Westport, and Milan. Now that's not something I expected to say during last year's annual State of the Church address. We are producing a tremendous amount of content. There were 49 video logs from me. There were 12 Mike Handler forums on the virus, five race forums with Tom Jones and Lee's Least, 18 times the storytellers read to children. There were five slideshows in the liturgy. Seven times we connected with people through art. There were 41 preludes and postludes that Ned put up. Ned is very popular on social media. Six times our choirs sang to us and always they were a joyful noise. There were seven stewardship witnesses. There were four classes on virtuous disagreement. Three vlogs from Father Justin and three vlogs from Reverend Elizabeth. All told, we produced 2,000 251 minutes and 58 seconds worth of spiritual content. That excludes our Sunday morning liturgies and the liturgies of our high holy days. Inspired by the parable of the sower, we have spread the seed of the kingdom on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To give you some sense of this, during the last 90 days on Facebook, nearly 300,000 people have seen something of St. Mark's scroll by their feed. This has resulted in 25,000 clicks on our content. In addition, since the pandemic, 190,000 minutes of St. Mark's video has been viewed on Facebook. And during the past year, 1.4 million people worldwide have seen something of St. Mark's on their Facebook page. And during the last year, we've gotten into the podcast business. We've produced 70 plus podcasts and 521 plus downloads to date. The top countries are the United States, Russia, and Germany. And the top cities are Darien and Moscow. Go figure. When's the last time you heard Darien and Moscow in the same sentence? So there it is. The church now has three BCs, before Christ, before the Common Era, and before COVID-19. Such is the impact of COVID-19. The church that entered the pandemic will not be the same church that comes out of the pandemic. So, who are we and where are we headed? Well, I'm just going to say where we're headed is who we already are. We are a massive energy center for Christ. We are a leader in the new parish church movement. We are a hybrid church that takes care of those who are local and those who are far off. And we are a church that seeks partnerships with people throughout the world trying to make it all a better place. And what about the coming year? So during the coming year, we are going to continue to surf into the future to meet people's needs, just as we have during the past year. We're going to explore and clarify our digital ministry, and we are going to expand our work to dismantle racism. That's going to include our Maranatha house churches. And in the coming year, we're going to prepare an endowment in capital campaign. Our greatest asset is the Spirit of God. Our second greatest asset is the people of God. What we really need are more financial resources to empower this spiritual people, to empower you. I have to say, there is almost nothing we cannot do with the appropriate financial resources. So now, I just have to say, carpe diem, let us all seize the day, let us be bold, let us claim the high calling. The world has great need for that which we have to offer. I am so grateful to each and every one of you. Even if you just tune in once in a while, you say a prayer once in a while, it all contributes to this great community of love. And I am so grateful to the living flame of love, that spirit of God which inspires us to go out into the world to be instruments of God's grace to a hurting and broken world. As far as I can tell, that is the meaning of life and that there is no higher calling. So peace be with you. God bless you. See you again soon. Take care.